Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me? Is, is it fine? Good. Uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, very excited to be here at Crypto. I really enjoy the weather in Santa Barbara. I enjoyed it so much that two nights ago at the Anna Capalone, I got a bad sore throat, so I will try my best, but if you don't understand, just raise your hand, wave, and uh, I will repeat. Good, so uh, uh, in this work, uh, we studied the um, quantum security of classical encryption schemes. Uh, before you start shouting post-quantum, wait a second. So uh, just to fix the ideas, I'm only going to talk about uh, symmetric key encryption scheme or secret keys encryption schemes. Uh, this is, I mean, there's nothing fancy here. Uh, it's one of the simplest cryptographic primitives that you can think of. You just have one secret key, and then you have one encryption procedure and one decryption procedure. Uh, each of them map, uh, respectively, plain text to ciphertext and ciphertext to plain text. And this primitive is classic. So whenever you see the yellow box, it's a classic uh, encryption scheme. Okay, so what can we say about the security of, uh, of this encryption primitives? So usually when we model security of these schemes, we have something like this in mind. So we have some adversary, and since we look at computational security here, we consider the adversary to be uh, uh, a bounded, a polynomially bounded uh, machine. And the adversary interacts in a classical way with the scheme, and after some interaction, it breaks the security of the scheme, whatever it means. So then when we look at the security of the schemes against quantum adversaries, so what, what we usually do is uh, we give the adversary access to a quantum computer. So now we model the adversary as a bounded quantum machine, but the interaction with the scheme is still classical because the scheme is a classical object. And this is usually what we call post-quantum security. Now, I would like to show you why this might not be enough sometimes. So there might be cases where you want to give a bit more power to the adversary. So usually what the model that we have in mind is something like this. So we have an adversary and the adversary is trying to compromise the security of some ex external target, some user. But what might happen in reality is something similar to this scenario. So the target of the adversary might be a tiny encryption device using some fancy technology. We already have chips using you know, optoelectronic uh, components and uh, optic fiber. So when things become more and more like this, people start having fun and become creative. So this is what happens. So what you see here is a commercially available uh, equipment for performing fault analysis attacks on chips. Uh, so you know, there are these crazy hacker people having a lot of fun uh, shining lasers into your chip and uh, pouring liquid nitrogen on it and changing the voltage of the electricity. And by interacting in, with the device in an unexpected way, they can extract information which should not be available. And this is, uh, this thing was supposed to be, you know, science fiction until, I don't know, 20 years ago. But nowadays we have a whole branch of cryptography devoted to designing systems resistant to this kind of attacks. So uh, what we advocate in this case is the following. Uh, quantum security beyond post-quantum security. Uh, what we mean is that the adversary might be able to get quantum interaction with the classical device. This, is, this was our first uh, motivation, but there are other scenarios where this, is, uh, this might happen. So for, very briefly, uh, for example, you might consider the case where a classical primitive is used as a sub-protocol or a component or a, of a more uh, complex or involved quantum protocol. And then it's not clear how the security of the classical primitive combines with the security of the raw protocol. And this is also important in security reduction. Uh, you might also have this kind of uh, fault attack, let's call it, 
So where a honest user wants to run a classical algorithm on her quantum computer, and then at the end of the measurement, uh, at the end of the computation, measure the outcome in order to have a classical result to send over the internet or whatever. And then your adversary might tamper and interfere with the measurement operation and be able to access quantum information before the measurement. Finally, you might also have obfuscation. So the adversary might receive the code for performing encryptions in an obfuscated form. But then he might run it on his quantum computer. And then, to some extent, he might be able to at least partially uh, you know, interact quantumly with the, um, with the classical primitive. So this sounds strange. We are not the first one to consider this kind of, um, of model. In particular, I want to mention this work by Bonet and Zandri from 2013, uh, where they look at the security of encryption scheme and of classical encryption scheme, and they model the fact that the adversary could be able to perform quantum queries of this form. So instead of asking for the encryption of one message and receiving back the encryption, uh, the adversary might query the uh, encryption oracle on a superposition of uh, messages and get back a superposition of encryptions. Uh, so what's the situation so far? The situation so far, so the, the results from their paper uh, look as follows. So first of all, if you try to define uh, a reasonable or at least an intuitively, um, in, intuitively good uh, notion of security in this model, what you obtain is, a, an is an unachievable security notion. Then what you can do is to obtain a compromise, so to switch to an almost classical security notion. And this compromise works because you can show that it's achievable and it's strictly stronger than uh, indistinguishability under choose and plain text attack, which is the standard, uh, the, let's say the minimal security notion that you consider classically. And the situation looks like this. So on one end, you have equivalent notions of indistinguishability and semantic security for uh, the classical world. On the quantum side, you have a very strong notion that you cannot achieve. And in between, somehow, you have this uh, almost classical indistinguishability notion. So what we, do, oops, what we do is we extend this framework and we complete the, uh, you know, the, the framework for analyzing the security of, of encryption schemes by uh, defining a new security notion, quantum indistinguishability. Uh, we show that it's strictly stronger than other previous notion. We show that it's achievable. And then we show uh, equivalent uh, notions of semantic security. And let's see how we do it. So indistinguishability. Indistinguishability is a security notion for encryption scheme where you have an adversary. The adversary produces two plain texts of his choice. The two plain texts are sent to a challenger. And the challenger selects one of the two plain texts at random without telling the adversary, encrypts it, and sends back the encryption to the adversary. And we call this the challenge phase. The goal of the adversary is to guess which one of the two plaintext was encrypted. Uh, this is a classical notion. And also, uh, it can be extended to a stronger notion, which is called indistinguishability under chosen plaintext attack, where we give the adversary the possibility of uh, performing one learning phase before and after the challenge phase. Uh, by learning phase, I mean the adversary is allowed to query a polynomial number of times the encryption oracle adaptively on plain text of his choice. So what Bonet and Zendry did, this almost, quantum, almost classical security notion is they extend uh, the security notion to a quantum adversary where the learning phase is now quantum, but the challenge phase is still uh, it is still classic. So why is this? So first of all, they show that this notion is achievable, and it's, stri it's strictly stronger than the classical one. It, mm, and you might wonder, why, don't, why can't you 
just do a quantum indistinguishability phase as well. Well, what happens is that if you try to do this in the more natural way, you obtain this notion which is unachievable. It's unachievable because there is an attack which is completely independent of the encryption scheme that you consider, and it always allows the adversary to distinguish the encryption of different superpositions. Uh, if you have questions, I can show you later about this. Uh, so yeah, this notion is unachievable. What we did instead is the following. So we started from this consideration, and we looked at the implicit assumption that you have to make in order to uh, define this unachievable notion. And then we said, okay, can we do something different? I mean, whenever we, we have to make a choice, can we, can we do something different? And by looking at all the options, we span this uh, tree of security definitions, and then we look at it. So the, by choice, I mean, I don't know, can we rule out some form of entanglement? How can we give uh, additional constraints of the adversary? So the first thing we do is we cut off the tree, uh, uh, we cut off the branches which do not make sense because some of these options are, are not compatible with each other. From, from what is left, we remove the notions which are still unachievable because of the same attack uh, of the fully quantum notion. And then, of, amongst the few left candidates, uh, we pick up the one which is more, um, it's more targeted to our uh, security model. And I, uh, I don't have time to go into the detail of how we do this, but very briefly, just to give you an idea, these are the main differences with the unachievable notion. So, in the unachievable notion, uh, whenever you have an encryption oracle, this is basically assumed to be a gate, like a, a quantum gate, embedded in the circuit of the adversary. And this models a scenario where the adversary has almost complete control of the encryption, tar of the encryption device, or in this case, the target. In our case, instead, uh, we look at this model. So we consider a challenger as an external uh, device, as an external quantum circuit, uh, and the adversary has some communication channel uh, with this challenger, so he can query the, the challenger on superposition of, uh, of encryptions, uh, which is more suited to you know, a network scenario where the adversary wants to compromise some external target. Uh, another difference is the following. So usually what, mm, what you might consider is uh, the adversary selects one quantum state of his choice. This state is sent to the challenger the challenger encrypts the state and send it back. We consider something slightly different where the adversary is not allowed to feed quantum states directly to the challenger, but he is only allowed to select a classical description of a quantum state. Then this quantum state is gonna be built by the challenger, encrypted, and sent back. What do I mean by classical description? It's, it's nothing terrible. It's, uh, I don't mean that the adversary has to specify the amplitudes of the state. I only mean that uh, the adversary uh, specifies the quantum circuit producing the state. Why we do this? Um, the reason is that classically there is no difference between a message and a classical description of the message. In the quantum world there is a huge difference because uh, the former, I mean, if you, can find a, if you can directly feed a message to the challenger, you can entangle yourself with the state. And this is something which we consider a bit unreasonable in our scenario. But we can get rid of this. I will show you later. Uh, the last thing is usually when you consider encryption operations, this is what, what is done. In, this is the canonical way of evaluating a classical function as a unitary. Um, you, you do it like this because this allows you to uh, revert, the, to invert the operation even if the function is not uh, invertible. 
But in our case, we are not dealing with one-way functions or uh, anything like that. We are dealing with encryptions with, by their own nature, they are uh, reversible operations. So what you can do is this type of operation instead. So you can simply encrypt on the fly, uh, you know, the, the quantum register. Now, uh, these kind of operations are very well known and studied, and then you might know them as minimal oracles. And it is well known that they are very different from what we call type one. In particular, they are more powerful because if you want to uh, build a circuit computing the type two operation, you need the secret key. Uh, despite this, uh, we can show that in our model, they are both acceptable. So by keeping in mind these differences, we define our notion of uh, quantum indistinguishability under quantum choose and plain text attack. It is easy to see that it's at least as strong as the other achievable notions, but we can say more. We can say that it's strictly stronger. And how do we do this? Well, consider the following scheme. This is a very standard encryption scheme uh, which uses a pseudo-random function to generate uh, a key for the one-time pad, basically. It's, a, it's a, the standard construction that you probably know from your textbooks. And Bonet and Zender showed that as long as the PRF is quantum secure, this notion, uh, this scheme achieves their security notion. But what we, what we can show is that this scheme is insecure according to our notion. And this is a consequence of a more general impossibility result that we give, uh, which covers a much broader range of encryption schemes. The impossibility result goes as follows. So whenever you consider an encryption scheme which works by you know, taking the plain text, encrypting it, and appending some randomness independent of the plain text, uh, we say that whatever is not independent of the plain text is what we call the core function of the cipher. And we say that a scheme is quasi-length preserving if this core function is a bijection. Uh, basically, it means that the scheme does not uh, uh, meaningfully increase the size of the encryption in respect to the size of the plain text. And there are a lot, uh, I mean, a lot of examples we have work like this. So for example, I keep spoiling my slides, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, for example, the Goldreich scheme, one-time pads, block ciphers in ECB mode, stream ciphers, these are all, all of them are of this form. And our impossibility result is, if you have a scheme which is quasi-length preserving, then it cannot be secure according to our definition, which is terrible, because then you might wonder, okay, what do you do with the security definition? Uh, what's the problem here? The problem is that, uh, you know, whenever you have an encryption procedure, this works by mapping plain text to a ciphertext space in an unpredictable way, but for a quasi-length preserving scheme, uh, this mapping is actually a permutation on a smaller subspace which is somehow easy to identify. So what happens now is that, uh, yes, um, so you see, if you have, um, so you have one plain text, this is mapped to a ciphertext in this smaller subspace, and therefore, if you have a distribution of plain text, this is mapped to a distribution on the smaller ciphertext, but keeping the amplitudes. And now you see the problem, because if this distribution becomes smoother, also the target distribution, as spread as it can be, it gets smoother and smoother, until you arrive at uh, you know, the uniform distribution, and the uniform distribution is mapped to a uniform distribution of ciphertext in the target space. What does it mean? It means that there are quantum states, quantum superposition of messages, 
which are left unchanged by the encryption operation. And this is a consequence of the fact that in the quantum world, if you want to encrypt one qubit, you need two bits of classical information. We have seen it uh, at the talk by uh, Ifke before that uh, also for the quantum one-time pad, you need one bit uh, for, uh, zero, for masking zero one and one bit for masking plus minus. So these states are easy to distinguish. And then you, it, it, it's clear that you cannot reach a satisfiable security, um, a security argument if you have this problem. How do we overcome this problem? Well, this is our solution. We consider an additional randomness space next to the plaintext space, and we merge the two spaces together. At this point, what happens is that uh, the, uh, the mapping uh, of the quasi-length preserving scheme is broken in the sense that now you don't have any more of this easily identifiable subspace. In particular, now, if you have a uniform distribution, a uniform superposition of plaintext, this is mapped, this is spread in a larger space in an unpredictable way depending of the, of the randomness. So if you change the randomness, it's spread in a different way. You change the randomness again, it's spread in a different way. How do we, uh, what do we do with this? Well, we consider a family of quantum resistant pseudo-random permutations. Then our encryption key is a permutation and its inverse. And when we want to encrypt a message, what we do is we just, so first we append some randomness to the state and then we encrypt. And this construction is secure according to our definition. Uh, of course, it does not uh, keep the size of the plaintext, but this is exactly what we need for achieving this level of security. And uh, yeah, the idea of the proof is to consider the mixer and the mixed state coming out from the encryption. Okay, so just to sum up, I'm just in time. Uh, this is the, the, the situation that we have now. So we have this, uh, um, uh, we completed this framework for studying the security of uh, classical encryption scheme in, um, in the quantum world. There is more. So first of all, we show that the assumption of the classical description is not necessary. We can get rid of that. Uh, because all, all of our results basically hold even for arbitrary quantum states. The only thing is that uh, this classical description makes things a lot easier and it's more um, reasonable in our, in our scenario where the adversary is not able to, uh, to watermark somehow the challenger. Uh, next, what we do is we can show, we can extend our construction. Uh, basically, we use our construction with an, some sort of randomized uh, ECB mode of operation. So we can extend it to deal with messages of arbitrary size. So we are not restricted to, you know, one block uh, depending on the size of the permutation, but we can deal with arbitrary messages. And finally, uh, some other interesting directions to look at. Um, look at public key encryption. Everything should work fine in theory, but better be careful. So we haven't lo really looked at that. Uh, CCA security. Again, CCA1 should be trivial to extend. CCA2 is much trickier. And finally, a patch, a general patch to transform uh, schemes, security according to the almost classical definition into schemes secure, secure according to our uh, definition. So this concludes my talk. Uh, thank you very much, and if you have questions.